Pure white and deadly. 1. What's so different about sugar? Sugar is common enough in all our lives, and almost everyone believes that it is simply an attractive sweet, one of many carbohydrates in the diet of civilized countries. But sugar is really quite an extraordinary substance. It is unique in the plant that makes it, in the materials that chemists can produce from it, and its use in foods at home and in industry. And recent research shows that it also has unique effects on the body, different from those of other carbohydrates. Since it now amounts to about one-sixth of the total calories consumed in the wealthier countries, it is essential that more is known about what it does to people when it enters the body in food and drink. Curiously enough, not only the layman, but also the physician and the medical research worker have until recently assumed that there was no need to bother with any special study of sugar. Since man began to produce his food instead of hunting and gathering it, his diet has contained large amounts of carbohydrates of one sort or another. It did not seem to occur to anyone that it made any difference whether this carbohydrate consisted almost entirely of starch in wheat or rice or maize, or whether the starch was gradually becoming replaced by increasing amounts of sugar, as has been happening in the last a hundred or two hundred years. Although some early research workers occasionally pointed out that eating sugar was not always the same as eating starch, no one paid much attention to this until twenty-five years or so ago. When I wrote a book on weight reduction in 1958, I strongly recommended a diet low in carbohydrate, but I made very little distinction between the benefits of avoiding starch and avoiding sugar. Since that time, an enormous amount of new information has been accumulating, and more is being added constantly. Most of the new research has, quite properly, appeared in scientific and medical journals, but it seems now worthwhile to summarize it for non-technical people. After all, it is not only scientists and physicians who eat, and if eating sugar really is dangerous, then everyone should be told about it. The fact that so much about the effects of sugar is still being discovered is in itself an illustration of how unexpected it was to find so many differences in these effects from those of other common foods. You might have imagined that the realization that there were differences would have stimulated the sugar producers and refiners themselves to initiate studies into the properties of their product. Other industries which produce foods like meat or dairy products or fruits have spent a great deal of money over the years to carry out or support nutritional studies on their products, even though these foods form a smaller proportion of the Western diet than sugar now does. But the sugar people seem quite content to spend their money on advertising and public relations, making claims about quick energy and, as we shall see later, simply rejecting suggestions that sugar is really harmful to the heart or the teeth or the figure or to health in general. I cannot claim that everything I say in this book will be accepted by every research worker. I hope, however, that I have made it clear which parts of the book refer to solid, observable scientific research and which parts are my own opinions and interpretations of these observations. Only time will show how right or wrong I am in any one particular personal statement. But right at the outset, I can make two key statements that no one can refute. First, there is no physiological requirement for sugar. All human nutritional needs can be met in full without having to take a single spoon of white or brown or raw sugar on its own or in any food or drink. Secondly, if only a small fraction of what is already known about the effects of sugar were to be revealed in relation to any other material used as a food additive, that material would be promptly banned. Take the case of cyclamates. Some countries now do not permit this sugar substitute to be used, and the prohibition is based on experiments 
in which rats were fed for an enormously long time on huge amounts of cyclamate, the equivalent of a man consuming 10 to 12 pounds of sugar every day for 40 or 50 years. Later in these pages, you can read what can happen to rats fed sugar in amounts, hardly if at all, different from those consumed by very many people. I will not anticipate the details that you will find, but the very many effects include enlarged and fatty livers, enlarged kidneys, and a shortening of lifespan. Think of all this the next time you read of an experiment that suggests that another sugar substitute may be harmful, as happened when aspartame was introduced. Note the blaze of publicity encouraged by the busy men and women who run such organizations as Sugar Information Incorporated or the Sugar Bureau. Then think of what is already known that sugar can do, as distinct from what the substitute might possibly do if taken in enormously unrealistic amounts for a long enough time. My own view is that it is perfectly safe to use these sweeteners whenever you wish to, although, for what I consider quite inadequate reasons, you cannot find cyclamate in some countries. But although they are quite safe, some people think it a good idea not to use sweeteners. They prefer to get into the habit of having less sweetness in their foods and drinks by avoiding those foods that must be made with sugar. Many people have criticized what I have previously written. They say that the experiments that we and others have carried out have used absurdly high amounts of sugar to produce the effects we describe. One such person is the American physiologist Dr. Ansel Keys, the most important and certainly the most dogmatic research worker who expounds the view that coronary disease comes from dietary fat and that sugar has nothing whatever to do with it. He has written that the level of sugar in the experimental diets are of the order of three or more times that in any natural diet. This is quite untrue, as we shall see, but it comes about because very few people have bothered to find out how much sugar people do, in fact, consume. You hear stories that the Turks take a very great deal of sugar, as you can see from the amounts they put into their coffee. But the Turks, even now, only take about one half of the amount consumed in Britain and the United States, and twenty years ago, the Turks took less than one quarter. Apart from these sort of questions, you can also go wrong when you look at official statistics without reading the small print. There have been regular annual reports of the British diet for the last 40 years, and the figures given for sugar now amount to an average of about £32 a year. But if you look carefully, you will see that the statistics do not include snacks or food eaten away from home, and the real average turns out to be more than three times as much, about a hundred pounds of sugar a year. If you now take into account that this is an average, and that many people take much more sugar than the average, you will find that the quantities used in experiments with human beings and animals are by no means extraordinary or absurd. And what about Dr. Key's reference to the sugar content in any natural diet? What is a natural diet? Is it natural for Westerners today to eat 20 times as much sugar or more compared with what our ancestors ate only two or three hundred years ago, and vastly more than our earlier ancestors had ever eaten? Nowadays we hear so often the words natural and moderate we really must be on our guard not to be misled into believing that they have any real meaning, or even worse, that they provide evidence that something to which these words are applied is intrinsically wholesome, good, and desirable. I hope that when you have read this book, I shall have convinced you that sugar is really dangerous. At the very least, I hope I shall have persuaded you that it might be dangerous. Now, add to this the fact, the indubitable fact, that neither you nor your children need to take any sugar at all, or foods and drinks made with it, 
in order to enjoy a completely healthy and highly nutritious diet. If, as a result, you now give up all or most of your sugar eating, and I shall show you later that this is not too difficult, I shall not have wasted my time in writing this book, and more importantly, you will not have wasted your time in reading it.